Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, Eurofa talk titled Sifona Budget, How Consumers Are Adjusting to Reduce Purchasing Power. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a very interesting and uh, hot topic. My name is uh, Francesca Barazzetta. I'm part of the Eurofa team, and uh, today I will be moderating this event. I think uh, we can uh, just wait a few more minutes so that uh, everyone that has uh, signed up to the event can, uh, can join us. And in the meantime, I will take uh, the time to give you some technical information. Uh, today's event is uh, being recorded and the registration will be made available on the UMOFA YouTube channel, as well on the UMOFA uh, website, together with the uh, presentation of uh, the speakers that we have uh, today with us. Also, all, uh, all the participants are muted and uh, your microphone, uh, your cameras are off, except for the speakers and the moderator. Uh, of course, we encourage all of you to ask uh, uh, constantly uh, questions to the speakers and to do so, please uh, ask your question in the bottom uh, chat box on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, we will go through your question after the presentations, but also we will have a Q&A session uh, at the end of uh, the, all the speakers' uh, uh, presentation. And of course, we will hope to, um, to answer all your questions. Um, so I want to specify that uh, today's webinar is uh, taking place under the framework of uh, the activities of HIMOFA. Uh, the European Market Observatory for Fisheries and Aquaculture Products, which is an initiative of the European Commission, Director General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. Today, we have with us uh, three experts who I will introduce to you very shortly. And uh, the experts are going to provide an overview of the current dynamics shaping the seafood industry within the EU. What are the challenges and the opportunities that are emerging in an era of reduce, reduced disposable income that we are living today? Moreover, they will describe how the current economic pressure is influencing purchasing decision and the consumption landscape of fisheries and aquaculture products, and how consumers' behavior and attitudes are shaping fisheries and aquaculture products within the European Union in a context on the, of uh, shrinking disp disposable income as uh, it is happening nowadays. And uh, to talk about uh, this topic, today we have with us we have uh, um, Dimitar Tasco, a fish value chain expert from FAO. Els Beder, the Director of Product Policy and Sustainability at Eurocommerce, and Patrizio Piozzi, expert on seafood consumption analysis from Ismea. But uh, before starting the event, I would like to give the floor to Christophe van de Weyer, a policy officer in DG Maritime Affairs and Fisheries of the European Commission, who will provide us a brief introduction of uh, the topic of uh, today's talk. So welcome, please, Christoph. Please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you all for attending uh, this talk. Well, before I leave the floor to our speakers, I would like to briefly explain why we considered this topic particularly relevant from the point of view of the uh, European Commission and of DG Marie in particular. The thing is that for more than three years now, the fishery and aquaculture sector is hit by external shocks, which have uh, rapidly led to increasingly important market disruptions. Uh, there was the, the Brexit, of course, uh, but also the COVID crisis and then the Russian invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. So we, uh, I mean, in, in DG Mare, and with the support of uh, the observatory, UMOFA, we have been following and monitoring the market's development as closely as possible in order to understand what was happening across the value chain, uh, in order to provide useful information to the stakeholders, be it uh, the industry or the national administrations, and also inform uh, our own policy making, in particular to set up uh, the crisis measures that were put in place to support the sector. The thing is that what appeared to be mainly a shock on uh, the supply the supply side, um, be it among other things because, for example, of the social distancing measures that slow down the production or the logistic chain during the COVID crisis, or from the moment the war uh, in Ukraine uh, broke out, the peaking fuel costs that led uh, hundreds of uh, fishing vessels to remain uh, docked, um, the shortages of certain raw material like fish feed or 
sunflower oil, etc. So that was mainly a shock on the supply side. But all in all, during all that period, so over the first years, uh, the demand, the demand uh, remains quite robust uh, over that time, uh, keeping prices at uh, sound levels. But we also knew rapidly that sooner or later, there would be an effect on the demand side um, because of the general pressure on, also on household uh, revenues resulting from, from the general inflation, in particular on energy costs, uh, but general inflation, of course, on all commodities uh, and on food commodities, uh, of course. What we didn't know uh, was from when this would materialize and what would be the effect on the fishery and aquaculture markets. So the question was really whether consumers would choose cheaper uh, seafood uh, or would there be a substitution towards uh, cheaper or alternative decrease in consumption? All these were uh, and still are a question mark. So this is why we believe that a talk like the one we have today will, will help us understand uh, what is happening and provide uh, useful indications on also on what can be expected. So thank you a lot uh, for your attention and we will be there after the talks for all your possible questions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Christophe, for, uh, for the introduction and uh, for provide, providing uh, uh, the audience with uh, uh, the observation uh, uh, from uh, the commission about the topic that uh, we're going to address today in this talk. So now I think we can uh, we can start, uh, and I'm happy to introduce uh, the first speaker for today's uh, event, which is uh, Dimitar Tasco. Uh, Dimitar is a fish value chain expert at the Fishery and Aquaculture Division of FAO. His work focuses on the analysis and development of fisheries and aquaculture value chain and related aspects, including end market assessment and sustainability certification. Uh, he holds a bachelor, master, and PhD in aquaculture from the Institute of Aquaculture at Stirling University from the UK. Uh, please, uh, Dimitar, uh, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, I'll share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Francesca, and um, good morning, good afternoon to all participants. Um, also, thanks to Yumoko for inviting me to this uh, talk uh, today. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to be talking about some trends, general trends in the demand for uh, uh, eco-labeled fisheries and aquaculture products with a focus on the European Union and try to understand uh, what is the impact or what the impact of uh, the challenging economic situation could be on uh, the demand for this uh, kind of products. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking uh, about uh, the macroeconomic context first, um, trying to uh, identify some consumer reactions to the increasing prices. First, we'll, we'll see what the prices are and how much they have been increasing and then what uh, strategies consumers have been adopting. Um, then we're going to look at some uh, drivers of eco certification and try to understand what is uh, what are the market forces that uh, drive uh, eco certification for fisheries and aquaculture products. Um, and finally, we're going to look at some numbers. Uh, on the supply side, how much product have been, has been certified over the last few years before uh, drawing some conclusions. Um, I should say at this point that uh, precise numbers uh, and very detailed numbers uh, on uh, certification in fish and aquaculture products is not widely available. Um, so uh, can you see my screen? No, still? Uh, no, not anymore. Uh, oh. I think you stopped sharing the presentation. Okay, I will share my screen. Um, 
So I will depend primarily on what has been published um, in in uh, this in the literature um, on these topics, and try to put the trends that uh, we observe from the published uh, uh, studies together with um, the macroeconomic context to try to der derive some conclusions about what these potential impacts might be. First of all. Um, we can see um, here in these two graphs uh, the changes in prices for food uh, as measured by the FAO food price index, uh, which is a measure of uh, price uh, combining uh, five different food categories and it's um, across the, it's, it's a global uh, coverage. And we can see um, that in, um, the last couple of years, uh, the prices have been increasing significantly, reaching um, all-time high in uh, uh, 2022. Uh, but since then, there is uh, some decrease in the prices, um, indicating um, that inflation is uh, is, is decreasing, but still it's quite it's, it's higher and higher than uh, the prices are higher than previous periods. Um, we can see the five categories of food that comprises this index. Um, vegetable oils um, has experienced a considerable price um, reduction over, over the last year or so, um, as well as cereals, dairy products. However, this has been slightly offset by the increasing price of sugar and meat. Um, now, there is a separate index uh, being published by FAO, which is the Fish Price Index. Um, and we can see um, a similar trend in terms of rising prices for fish globally um, on this graph here. Um, in 2022, 23, the prices of uh, fish um, and, and, and seafood were higher than um, since uh, this in index has uh, been calculated over this period. Uh, and if we look uh, closer um, into the sources of uh, uh, these products, whether this is capture or aquaculture, we can see that um, primarily this increase is coming from the capture uh, fisheries uh, products, especially some products uh, like ground fish, um, so some ground fish species and tuna species have experienced a considerable price increase. Now, um, this price increases, this inflation in, in the food prices, of course, has a profound effect on, on the food security um, and uh, on the nutritional, um, uh, on the nutrition of, of, of uh, people across the world, especially. Uh, in developing countries, especially the countries that are dependent on uh, imports for meeting their um, food demands. Um, but um, the effects are experienced uh, everywhere, including in the European Union. And we can see here uh, in this uh, graph um, uh, by, uh, the, uh, by Eurostat, um, the European Union's harmonized index of consumer prices, which covers all categories of consumption, but there's a similar um, um, trend of increasing prices uh, in 2022, but then followed by a slight decrease, um, uh, decreasing inflation, but still higher prices than, than in previous periods. This is for all consumption categories. Now, specifically for uh, fish and seafood, um, here we can see a couple of indicators. Um, published by UMOFA in their uh, macroeconomic dashboard, uh, producer price index and consumer price index uh, for fish and seafood and meat. Um, we can see since 2022, a considerable increase in the prices uh, for both categories, both uh, on the producer uh, and consumer side of, uh, of, of the value chain. Um, an increase of around uh, 25 percentage points in both cases, uh, even even higher in, in the producer uh, uh, price index. Um, 
And this indeed is um, being felt by um, the consumers in the European market as this study uh, conducted by Aarhus University um, covering 10 uh, European countries and 5,000 consumers shows. Uh, this is a, a recent study and these are preliminary results, but it shows that um, consumers, most of the consumers, more than 70% of them, perceive a price increase across all the categories of uh, uh, food, uh, whether this is a slight increase or a, or a significant increase, uh, but there is a price increase perceived. Uh, in fact, for fish, um, most of the consumers, and for meat as well, uh, they um, perceive a significant price increase. This um, uh, price increase or uh, um, this perception of price increase has been um, um, tackled by different strategies on the consumer uh, side, uh, as the study shows. Um, some potential strategies to um, face this uh, price increase is by buying less uh, of the food that they're usually used to buy. Uh, and we can see this here in, with blue uh, in, in uh, terms of fish, um, for example, uh, or stop, um, stop buying altogether. So about half of, the, of those consumers who say that they have changed their behavior uh, have either decreased their consumption or stopped buying altogether, and the other half, uh, roughly, um, or um, uh, they uh, um, uh, say that uh, they do some kind of substitution, whether this is uh, towards cheaper brands of the same uh, food category or other, other uh, stores that uh, probably sell uh, uh, at a lower price, like discounters, for example. So these are the main uh, strategies that, that consumers have um, used to cope with, with the increasing prices, decreasing um, um, their consumption or substituting. And based on that, we can expect that the overall uh, quantities demanded by the uh, European market would have also uh, decreased. Uh, and then there is some substitution across food categories towards cheaper alternatives. Um, more precisely, if we look at what uh, this effect uh, of decreased consumption might, might have been on, on the European market, um, we can see by looking at this table by Eumolfa again and published in their uh, most recent monthly highlights from June uh, last month, um, which shows that in the period uh, between uh, March 2022 and March 2023, uh, for those countries, 10, 11 countries um, in the European Union, which covered most of the uh, consumption efficiency for products in the European Union, um, there is an overall uh, decrease in the consumption in terms of volume, especially. Um, very pronounced in some cases, like in Denmark, uh, but overall uh, there is a decrease. But the other thing that it shows as well is that there is a um, uh, heterogeneity. There is no um, uh, single way in which uh, the markets respond, but there is a uh, diversity of, of responses depending on the country um, and, and, in, and, and depending and, and in the magnitude of, of this response as well. The, the European Union is not uh, one uh, uniform market, but it's, it's a diverse uh, set of customers. So that needs to be also taken into account. Um, However, overall, we can see um, a decrease uh, apart from two countries for which there is a slight increase and two that are uh, no change. So at this point, we can um, ask ourselves the question, what, what could uh, the impact of this decrease in uh, consumption in the demand quantities of seafood can be on um, the sustainability of, 
of production because um, this uh, will have impacts not only um, on nutrition and food security, but also likely on um, on the sustainability, environmental sustainability of of, of production uh, through, uh, for example, decreased demand for um, eco labels. Um, and we can see here an example of a few common eco labels, um, which um, uh, can be, which signify that uh, when 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 they are displayed on the on the on the product, signify that it has been produced according to uh, some standards of of uh, environment uh, environmental standards of production. Um, but first of all, let's let's see what is eco certification um, and try to understand how it works. Uh, be able to answer this question. Eco certification is a market-based approach uh, to govern um, some negative uh, aspects of uh, or, or negative externalities of, of business practices. And it is a market-based approach because it's the consumers uh, on, on the end market that, uh, in, in theory, exert the uh, uh, control over um, production by making a choice, if they have a choice of products, and uh, uh, coming across um, a product with a certification and that they recognize their, in theory, they can choose this product and in this way vote or um, uh, encourage um, the production of uh, and the supply of such products and therefore the uh, sustainability um, of the production methods. Um, there are different kinds of uh, certification uh, that cover different aspects of sustainability. Um, some of them uh, focused more on uh, environmental aspects, others also including social issues. Uh, and they cover different stages of the value chain, but the common thing about them is that they're voluntary standards um, and they are um, third party uh, audited, they adhere to third party verification systems, which means that um, the producer is uh, audited by um, a third party, an uh, independent auditing body and not the, the standard holder, which increases the credibility of these standards, but also uh, it has a cost associated to it. And so um, in theory, um, this cost, uh, increased cost of production and, and for certification should be covered by a price premium uh, on the market, um, which uh, the consumer is ready to pay to support uh, the better practices. And this price premium is then transmitted back uh, uh, through the value chain and uh, encourages the uh, producers to um, um, engage in, the, in those practices and, and, and become eco-certified. This is one of the, of the drivers for uh, certification. Uh, but um, there has been a debate uh, in the literature whether there is actually um, uh, a price premium. What is the price premium? And so um, here on this table, um, we can uh, have a look at some published um, numbers uh, in, in uh, peer-reviewed journals about uh, price premiums. Mm -hmm. What we can see here is different species uh, and um, Different different markets um, and uh, two different kinds of certification MSC and ASC. Uh, what we can see is that there is a variation in uh, in the price premiums uh, according to those authors. Um, it can range from um, zero for some species like say in the German market or uh, nephrops in the Swedish market according to these studies uh, or uh, up to it can be as high as 30 percent in some high-end cod species for example in the in the German market or it can be somewhere in uh, in between um, we can see four four percent for example for Alaska Pollock or uh, Ten percent for hard duck, twelve, fourteen, thirteen percent um, for the ASC, which is an aquaculture uh, 
certification, uh, we can see nine or six percent, and this is the only paper I could find for uh, published for for uh, price printing the aquaculture um, um, eco labels. Um, so what we see overall is a uh, um, diversity of of uh, possibilities, and this is something that these authors also uh, emphasize. Um, there is, there may, may be a, a, a price premium, but it varies. Uh, it varies by the market, it, it varies by the species, um, which um, um, we talk about. Um, and it varies also by uh, the uh, retailer. In some retailers, um, these uh, price premiums will be more pronounced than, than in others, depending on what their overall pricing strategy is. Uh, so, uh, suffice to say, there might be a premium, um, but it's not a guaranteed one. And um, uh, what we don't know for sure also is how much of this price premium, if there is any, is transmitted actually back to the um, primary producers, fishermen or uh, aquaculture farmers. Um, this is one of the drivers. Another one that uh, the literature also emphasizes is um, the role of, of retailers uh, in driving um, the proliferation of, 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 aquacul of aquaculture and fisheries uh, eco-labeling and uh, eco-labeled products. Um, because um, retailers uh, increasingly make commitments to source uh, most of all of their uh, products from eco-certified uh, sources. Uh, in other words, sourcing only sustainably uh, certified products. For example, here is here's a couple of examples, but there are many more. Um, Lidl has made such a commitment. Uh, um, uh, this is an example from Ireland, stocking uh, on the uh, MSC or ASC uh, global or global gap uh, seafood products. Uh, another example from um, um, a hold um, committing to 100% uh, um, sus uh, sustain sustainable uh, certified products from acceptable standards. Um, so. If, if uh, more and more um, retailers make commitments to source uh, sustainable certified products as part of their strategies, uh, corporate social responsibility strategies, um, that means that over time, uh, as these standards become more and more uh, prevalent on the market, it is likely that the um, differentiation associated with them and any any price premium um, associated with them is likely to de decrease as they are becoming more uh, more common on the market and more expected uh, from the retailers. Um, in other words, um, becoming more of a requirement to enter the market rather than a source of differentiation so this is one one of the one of the drivers uh, as well uh, for um sustain for sustainability um uh, certification one of the main drivers according to the literature but also um um, commitments come from the production side um, in, in terms of salmon, for example, we can we can see this uh, commitments from uh, Maui, 100% uh, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to um, achieve 100% of their stocks are certified sustainably uh, um, by um, GSSA recognized standards. Also, uh, the global Global Salmon Initiative, which is a pretty competitive collaboration of uh, salmon farming companies, also make a um, commitment to um, reach 100% uh, of their production certified uh, by uh, ASC. Um, so we can expect that um, over time, um, uh, this 
quantities of, of certified product will increase also because of commitments uh, on the production uh, and of the value chain. Um, we can um, see some numbers of uh, quantities or share rather of the production of total global production uh, fish and seafood published by certification ratings collaboration, which show the share of uh, uh, sustainably certified uh, products here in, in, in blue. Um, this is covering only MSC and ASC, um, but that's that's the data that, that we have available publicly, um, which shows over these three years for which it is available, um, an, an overall increase in, in the quantities, uh, in the share of uh, fish and seafood. Um, certified by these accreditations. Um, and as I said, this ex excludes aquatic plants. But of course, these are not the only um, uh, schemes. There, there are others, so these numbers are, are, are likely to be actually higher. Uh, what we see is the is a general increase in the in the in the quantities over time. Um, so um, putting this information together and trying to draw some conclusions or other um, hypotheses um, for, uh, for the research um, is that um, the determinants of uh, the demand for eco-label fisheries in aquaculture products and fisheries um, are not solely linked to the, to the consumer choice, but uh, are also driven by um, uh, as we have seen, retailer commitment, um, uh, producer commitments uh, as well as part of their corporate social responsibility strategies. Um, and certification is uh, be increasingly becoming a condition to enter the European market, particularly uh, some uh, sections of the European market, north northwestern markets uh, in the EU. Um, and so um, over time, this uh, price premium or uh, differentiation associated with equilibrium is likely to decrease. And at the moment, if, if there is such a price premium um, in a situation which we are experiencing of increasing overall prices and reduced purchasing power of consumers, it is uh, possible that some consumers are switching towards other uh, cheaper products, um, especially um, uh, for, the, for those that have a higher a premium associated with them, unless the consumers are very loyal to the uh, uh, label, which they may uh, well be. Um, but over the long term, uh, we uh, expect that um, the quantities um, will uh, increase because of the, of the drivers that uh, uh, we have discussed um, in this presentation um, and um, the share of, of uh, eco-level products in fisheries and agriculture and, uh, in the European Union will continue to increase. Um, so here's some references and thank you for your attention. Um, don't hesitate to write me uh, with any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, uh, uh, Dimitar, for the very interesting uh, presentation, for providing an overview of uh, uh, price development and then the focus on uh, certification. Um, we have a first comment from uh, the audience. Um, that is uh, mentioning that uh, the household fish, cons fish consumption in Spain has uh, severely, severely decreased uh, when uh, we're taking into account the Finish fin fisheries ministry data. Uh, actually decreased between April 2022 and April 2023 by 12% and 11% uh, uh, for fresh fish. Um, while uh, in 2022, all fishery products decrease of almost uh, 16%. Um, so I don't know if you have any comment in uh, this regard, uh, in uh, this uh, specific aspect that uh, was highlighted by um, one of the participants. 
Um, yes, I I, um, I showed a table. In fact, the table that um, was published in this table. Um, well, it's 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 from the monthly highlights from Umofo. It it shows a. Uh, um, um, actually, stable market and uh, increasing value of the consumption for fresh fisheries and aquaculture products. Now, uh, this is uh, different from what the um, uh, comment that you have just mentioned, Francesca, is saying. Now, it might be um, um, to do with the methodology of how this is being calculated. This has to be looked um, in uh, in more detail, um, it may be covering um, different sections of the market or different um, um, species. Um, but uh, this is the data that uh, that, that I have uh, found. And mm -hmm. um, um, if uh, if the comment, uh, if if the person who made the comment. Uh, I would like I can look at the at the methodology for this and, and try to try to see where this may be coming from. Okay, yeah. But maybe maybe colleagues from from Hubonfa that are here also can uh, can say a little bit more about it uh, since it's 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 calculated by them. Yeah, probably I think uh, um, when uh, um, we take exactly in consideration the the um, the methodology and also in the, the longer period. Uh, um, percentages can also, like uh, when we consider the average and uh, and this kind of aspect, that can uh, can uh, can somehow uh, differ uh, between each other. But indeed, I think that uh, if uh, this uh, this conversation can be taken longer, and that the person that has asked this question can directly reach out to the Umofa team with uh, um, via email, and also I guess to um, Dimitar in uh, in uh, regards to this uh, to this aspect. Um, Christoph has a, has a comment, so if you want to uh, jump in, please. Uh, yes, indeed, just a, a quick reaction to uh, the question that was uh, raised. Uh, it is indeed very important to look at uh, the underlying figures because uh, on the one hand, we can have uh, decreases of uh, volumes and at the same time, increases in value simply be because the inflation has been uh, very important over the last couple of years. And uh, very often we see that uh, the inflation has more than compensated the decreases in volumes. So that when we look at uh, the value of uh, uh, trade flows, we see that there is an increase, uh, whereas at the same time there is an actual decrease in, in volume. So, but we are more than happy to investigate. Uh, maybe after we can uh, bilaterally investigate uh, uh, the, 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 the figures that were um, proposed by the uh, Spanish colleague, and of course we will. Uh, we will provide the information to the audience on uh, on what is, is the outcome of uh, this investigation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christo. Uh, I can see that uh, we are starting to receive uh, uh, questions and uh, the audience is uh, quite active, which is uh, very good. Uh, there are a few questions for uh, you, Dimitar, so we can take maybe a few now and then we can continue afterwards. But uh, one of the questions here, are there any, uh, are there major differences between uh, the different certification bodies? Uh, if they're similar, it is necessary for products to be certified by more than one to have the same positive effect in the market? Um, very good question. Um, they are, uh, they are slightly different. Um, uh, each, each one of them is emphasizing slightly different issues, but they cover broadly the same categories of, of, of impact uh, uh, and, and not all of them, but 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 some of them, and there is an initiative, uh, GSSI, um, uh, the Global Sustainable uh, Seafood uh, Initiative, which is trying to benchmark those standards um, against each other and against um, uh, international standards uh, like those published by uh, or provided by by the FAO. Um, Precisely because um, um, there is a there is too many of them and that may may cause uh, some confusion on the market and in fact the uh, 
one uh, standard, uh, uh, which is similar uh, to another, maybe maybe sub substitute substitutable, and uh, it's not necessary for the producer to um, be certified with, with all of them if they're mm -hmm. benchmarked by this initiative. And in fact, some of the retailers um, are committing to uh, supplying only um, um, products that are benchmarked by, by this um, uh, GSSI uh, initiative, um, anyone within them, uh, not any specific one, but anyone that has been benchmarked by them. Um, good question. Yeah. I hope it answers it. Yeah, I, I think uh, you did. Uh, you gave a very good, uh, good answer indeed. Um, also, there is another question coming in uh, regarding that uh, the EU heavily relying on uh, seafood imports, imports from uh, third countries. So, how do you see those countries' chances, chances to satisfy sustainability certification for their products um, that you mentioned it will become the standard in the EU? That in many cases are not farmed and caught within the EU standards. Um, so how do you see this, uh, this evolving or how can they apply this certification? Um, also a very good question. Um, uh, yes, we uh, see this trend of increasing demand for um, certified uh, products from the European Union. Um, uh, so um, we know also that there are uh, many small scale producers uh, across the world that uh, for whom there may be um, it, it may be difficult to uh, um, individually get certified by by those standards but um, there are some options for example that can that can cover this uh, producer segment uh, group certifications uh, that is is also seeing an increase in in the aquaculture um, in, in the aquaculture uh, uh, se sector. Um, this is one uh, way um, which it can expand um, production from third countries, particularly where there are many small scale producers. Okay, thank you. And uh, moving a little bit uh, towards the consumption, uh, based on your experience, have you seen uh, like a decrease in uh, the latest uh, period in the consumption of uh, certified products from uh, directly from consumers? Um, have, uh, like uh, um, the, if the amount of uh, certified uh, uh, sustainability certified products has been uh, has been decreasing. Uh, well, as I mentioned in my presentation, I um, um, I don't have precise uh, data on the numbers of certified uh, quantities and uh, bought and, and sold on the market. Uh, maybe some other panelists uh, and other colleagues here uh, closer to the to the retail um, seg uh, sector can can give precise numbers but um, what we can expect is that um, the products uh, with uh, higher um, um, price premium which are not sufficiently um, differentiated or, or in which consumers are not sufficiently uh, committed to, to buying them may experience such a such a, such a decrease um, one paper that comes to mind to mind at the moment is is not for uh, eco labeled uh, products but for uh, label rouge salmon from Spain recently published which shows um, that during this period of increase in prices Surprisingly, uh, there is a, a little um, reduction in the in the frequency of consumption of label rouge salmon, which is uh, a high quality, high price product, uh, which means that it's sufficiently differentiated, um, and there is there is little um, substitution, which indicates it's it's just one case. It's difficult to generalize based on it, but it indicates that. Um, uh, differentiation um, may be a good strategy for uh, facing a difficult uh, situation uh, like this, increasing prices. Successful differentiation may be uh, for the producers um, 
um, a way to, to, to withstand uh, increasing prices and reduced consumption. So that is what I can say at this point. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dimitar, for uh, your uh, presentation and for answering the question. Um, I think we can, that we can uh, move forward to our next speakers. But uh, if you have uh, more questions for Dimitar, please keep uh, writing them in the chat and we can uh, uh, take them over afterwards. So now I'm uh, happy to present our second speaker for today, which is uh, Elsie Derrick. Els is the Director of uh, Product Policy and Sustainability at Eurocommerce, the European Voice for Retail and Wholesale, which she joined in uh, 2012. In this role, she's leading Eurocommerce activities aimed at improving product safety, quality, and integrity for food and non-food products, including the farm to fork strategy and broader sustainability issues such as the circular economy, deforestation, and due diligence. Previously, Els worked at the European Commission Directorate for Enlargement as team leader responsible for the TAIEX assistance on EU law related to agriculture, veterinary, phytosanitary, and food safety to public administra in administrations in potential candidate countries. She also dedicated a part of her career to development cooperation to improve food safety and food security for livestock keepers in Africa. Uh, welcome, Els. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me properly? Yes, very well. Okay, great. Um, yeah, if you can bring up my presentation. Thanks very much. Sorry for the long introduction. <laughs> yeah, you, can, you can hear that I've had a little bit of a, a different uh, career up to now and, uh, and now working for uh, retail and wholesale. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, maybe a few words uh, for those of you that don't know Eurocommerce. Um, so we are the, 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 the EU uh, voice for retail and wholesale, and we uh, gather all um, the retail and wholesale actors. So not only food, but also the non-food uh, retailers, so, such as for um, furniture or DIY or textiles, and they're all part of our association. Um, here on the slide, you see uh, the logos of our company members. So you can see here that there is indeed a wide variety. And you can also see some of the logos that were already popping up in the previous presentations, such as Al Dales or, or Little, that are uh, part of our association. Uh, but we also have all the national trade associations uh, across the EU that are gathering a lot of um, SME retail and wholesale um, in, in their membership. And then we have also some other uh, EU, um, EU uh, associations that are more sort of like on chemicals distribution or on electronics. Um, and they all find their place in our house, let's say. Um, so we stand for fair, competitive and sustainable retail. This is really the message that we want to um, carry out to the policymakers and to the uh, stakeholders. And we are a very important sector. And I'm, I may say um, one in four companies 10% of the European GDP and, and one in seven jobs. So I think we have uh, we have quite an impact on, on the market. And um, and again, I, we heard some good examples already uh, in the previous presentation, which I will also be uh, touching upon uh, now. Uh, next, please. Um, yeah, so I, I will be referring to some documents, which those of you that are on the call that are more interested to really about how retail and wholesale works, um, you can find more uh, in, in this fact book that you can also find on our website. Um, just to summarize, it is really, I mean, the reason of being for our sector is to, to serve consumers, to help consumers, to make the right purchasing choices and to do that in a sustainable way and in line with their, um, you know, with their uh, living uh, conditions or living um, uh, requirements. Um, and we also, as I mentioned, inclusive employers, but we also, and maybe this is something which sometimes forgotten, we're really very strongly embedded in a lot of uh, local communities and we have a very strong interaction with local producers and other um, uh, and other um, associations and, and communities uh, in, 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 our, uh, in the EU. Um, we also work a lot on digital technologies and I will say a little bit more about that later, uh, but this is our maybe our our, our key our key aims in, and and our reason of being. Next slide. Um, we are talking a lot about consumers uh, today, um, and and as I said, we we are here to serve consumers to help consumers make the right decisions, and this is actually a slide from pre-COVID. 
um, where you could really see a very different, very clear uh, change uh, in demand from consumers. Uh, consumers are, they can exert their choice, they can exert their, their, their demand to our sector. And we have seen, of course, a, a much stronger need for healthier foods, but also on the environmental aspect of the food, including animal welfare, ethical trade standards, everything that you can they can put on a sustainability because they really want to make the choice. They want to be able to, to choose uh, according to their ethical and, and other considerations. At the same time, they are also, or they have been asking for a lot more information about the food products that they buy. And this often also includes a supply chain transparency. So it's not only what you find, what's in the ingredients, but also how it is produced. And these are also questions that our members have been getting from uh, from the consumers over the years. Um, but importantly, uh, our consumers also ask convenience and they also ask for simplification. So there you already come into the into shopping experience, shouldn't be too long, shouldn't be complicated. Lots of people want to spend as little time as possible in store, um, but they really want still, they want to, to be able to choose and to be able to, to, to make this choice in an easy, in an easy manner. And, and this is of course all this, also in the light of this uh, changing demographics. I mean, you have an aging population, you have different types of households, um, again, a lot more on the go before COVID. Um, so all this is, uh, are, are changes in society that, that our sector needs to respond to, is responding to, and uh, was also mentioned, of course, in the eco-labeling and, and, and other uh, product choices. Uh, and this is what we really, uh, this is really part of the DNA of a retail and wholesale business to continuously innovate, continuously keep the finger on the pulse of what the consumer and society uh, wants. Uh, next slide. I just wanted to very briefly touch upon another report which we have uh, launched last year. Uh, and I think this also is important to understand because all, I think all uh, the, the, the businesses are, are, are facing a lot of, a, a very huge transformation. So we are talking here about the fisheries sector, but of course also for our sector, we are facing this triple transformation as we call it. We need to really uh, speed up on digitalization. We need to speed up on sustainability transition, but also on skills. And uh, we did a study together with McKinsey and just to show also that here, um, you know, we are all in this triple, this triple transformation, and 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 we need to all move together, together with our with our partners in the supply chain. Uh, so I invite you to also look in this uh, in this uh, report if you're interested. Available from our website. Um, next slide. Um, but what came in very clear is that. Um, there is a huge uh, investment uh, that is needed in the coming years, up to 2030, up to 600 billion to go through all these transitions. And sustainability here would mean circular economy, would, would mean transport, would mean packaging, would mean energy consumption. All these issues still need to be uh, moved forward quite quickly. Digitalization, we talk about e-commerce, but also infrastructure. Also for the very small SMEs to stay in business, you need to go to this transition to digitalization. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the skills and, um, and, and, and talents that are, that are uh, all our staff, we have a lot of staff in store, they need to be reskilled, upskilled. And uh, this also is a, is a very urgent, um, urgent um, pathway that we are all uh, entering. In. So again, if you're interested, I would invite you to uh, go and look at this report and see what is, uh, what is facing our sector uh, in particular. Uh, next slide. Um, but today I really, really wanted to focus in on the state of grocery and the annual reports that Eurocommerce has been doing now for the third three years in a row, together with McKinsey as well. Uh, and while we cannot, or I cannot um, provide a very detailed figures specifically on, on fisheries, um, I think it does, we see some trends which apply to the broad product categories, uh, including fishery trees, I think are very relevant uh, for, this, for this discussion. And, and indeed, I've already heard some of the points made again in the, in the previous um, presentation. So if you can go to the next slide. So we started uh, in, in, in 2021. Um, I think this was very clear. It's, this is where the first disruption and uncertainty came about. Um, uh, the COVID crisis, uh, a, a very clear and necessary shift to online sales, a huge increase 
because I mean, often if shops were closed or people were fe not feeling very confident to actually go in shops. So this is really where there was a huge uh, acceleration of, of uh, online shopping. It has calmed down again, but it did show and a lot of um, um, businesses really felt that this is really, they cannot delay any further to go also on the digitalization path. Um, but of course, also when there is this uncertainty, um, it, it immediately becomes clear in consumer confidence, consumer sentiment, and the way that uh, they shop. And um, this in this report, we found that 37% uh, of consumers were looking to save money. Um, but and this was a, a clear result from the COVID crisis. There was a, a strong, a strong um, interest still in healthy and local food because, again, you know, you want. COVID medical health issues, we felt that our consumers felt that this is even more important. Uh, but again, then um, you come to, the, to the, the problem that we are seeing is indeed, how do you serve those consumers that want to end in, um, and save money and, and have more sustainable food when there is maybe a premium attached to it? How do you serve uh, those consumers? Uh, next slide. So there is a little bit of a, a breakdown in this report um, at that time where you can see indeed the differences in gender and the difference um, uh, also in, in the age. But I think what, uh, what is important to see is that there's also a, a quite a big difference between, uh, between income, household, uh, in household uh, incomes and, and the, different, uh, the different effects, of course, which is logical that uh, increased prices would have on, on those uh, groups of, uh, of consumers. And, and you already see the trend here, but uh, it will become more prominent in the in the next uh, slides. Um, so price, definitely a very sensitive issue always, but I also want to refer to this uh, Eurobarometer that you all know um, that indeed I think for fish as well, like for other products, cost is an important uh, driver, but I think for, for, for fishery products, especially the appearance and the freshness is, is, is of crucial importance as well. Um, and then the origin, uh, again, in the light of the sustainability uh, debate. So this is, of course, something which, which I think we, we or as retailers, this is something that we, that we, fully, that we fully acknowledge in this uh, product category. Next slide, please. Um, so after the COVID, um, you know, there was, uh, it, it didn't end. I mean, there was a continued uh, extracted uh, a, um, a crisis. And um, of course, then you had the uh, Russian invasion. So that, that didn't, didn't help. In fact, it was causing a lot of, a lot of uh, problems everywhere. Um, and indeed, what we saw then in our report that we released uh, last year, um, there was a very clear polarization um, between the high and low income uh, households and an even higher uh, price sensitivity uh, in the, uh, in, in our, with our consumers. Next slide. And yeah, you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, um, I think so indeed. And this again, um, this is also what, um, of course, what the retailers have to react to. What I what I mentioned before, we are there to serve consumers, but of course, there is not one consumer. So like there is not one market in the EU. There are different requirements, and 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 our sector really wants to respond to that. Um, but what we saw last year is that we saw that indeed for the high income households, there was this continued interest in in quality products and in sustainability but we saw a very clear drop in the lower income households and really those moving away from, from those uh, higher end products or, or those that are, you know, and, and more sustainable with the premiums. And this is of course uh, causing problems. Um, I mean, it's not a nice thing to do. And I think we, want, we all want to give, uh, we all want to give accessibility to, to these uh, high quality and keep this, this accessibility to quite high quality and sustainable products. But this is the market that we have to deal with um, and, uh, and that we have to react to. So next slide. Again here, um, again, more, uh, more or sort of almost the same, the request like we want this, we want, we want healthy eating, the healthy, the healthy eating aspect was remaining stronger than the, than the sustainability and quality, which was a, a, a bigger drop, but the health aspect is more, uh, more permanent. 
Uh, but again, um, how do we save money um, and, and, and still being able to offer, uh, offer those, those products to the consumer and how do we respond to that? Uh, next slide. So then we 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 had our our recent most recent uh, most recent uh, report, which was uh, launched um, I think now a couple of months ago. Um, again, we are still in this crisis. This pressure of inflation really, um, you know, pulling on 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 the consumers, and they are down trading. Really, save more interest or more wanting to save more money money. Um, however, it's quite interesting that what we saw now is that there is this polarization that we saw in, in the previous year with this higher gap between the interest is actually reducing. So it's we are now seeing, or we have seen that both higher and lower income are really uh, looking to buy uh, cheaper uh, food products. So again, not the best situation to be in when you also want to go on this sustainability uh, uh, pathway. Next slide. Um, yeah, so, and I can and I can confirm, luckily, <laughs> what was said uh, in the previous uh, presentation. Indeed, there is different ways of uh, that in which the consumers will actually react to this. Um, and indeed, we 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 have we have seen that volumes are going down, this inflation going up, volumes going down, but the value is actually. Uh, not um, reducing in the same uh, amount, but the consumers are are looking indeed for cheaper alternatives. And we've seen a very uh, strong increase in or higher interest in private labels. So this is not the, the A brands, but um, the, the house brands are actually. Um, so maybe we should not call it, I think, uh, another, uh, it's not a different quality. It can be just as the same quality or um, different um, as, as the A brands but of course with a better uh, price uh, offer here. And at the same time as going more towards those private labels, we have also seen that uh, there is uh, the market share of the discounters um, has also uh, increased because of the same reason, uh, looking at, uh, at, at cheaper prices. But overall for us, like for everybody else, this has brought a very strong pressure on the margins, which actually in our sector are already very low, uh, between well less than five percent, most mostly around four to three to four percent, and um, and this is of course not um, uh, this is more more pressure, and this is one of the main uh, the main uh, concerns of, of, of also the CEOs to be able to uh, continue to do business. Uh, next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, as I, as I said um, before, now it's indeed like. Uh, going down, volumes are going down, um, and the changing of the, the shopping habits. This is what you can, um, more detail in what you can see in the in the report as well. Uh, and next slide. Um, again, a more detailed slide um, outlining what I was mentioning, um, reducing purchases of fresh produce, um, increasing the share of the private label, increasing the share of the, of the discounters, um, and looking really strongly looking for ways to save money, uh, but also importantly, actively search for the best promotions, uh, which is always uh, something which our consumers are actually quite appreciative of, of promotions of food, but now really even more, even more uh, actively looking for these to be able to save, to save money. And as I mentioned, um, it's really a further, a further down um, sizing in the high quality or the premium food products um, that we have seen because of the ongoing crisis and the inflation. If you go to the next slide, then you can see again what I was mentioning, um, further further down trading for these, these important products. But um, while in the previous year, the high income households were keeping an interest in this quality and in um, and in sustainability, they're also now becoming very price sensitive and and, and going down. Um, and overall, the sales for these products are uh, are under pressure. However, as I mentioned, and I think this is important, especially for this sector, is that healthy eating is actually keeping um, uh, a high interest of um, of the consumers. And I think for, for fish as a very nutritious and healthy product, 
I think this is something that we that we can um, you know we, we shouldn't forget focus of and and can be to the benefit of um, of, of this uh, this sector. Um, so next slide. This is more um, yeah more more again more detailed uh, slide where you can see uh, the price sensitivity and how it has increased and uh, the intent to buy more private label and the reduction of the, of the quality or premium food um, interest of the consumers that you can see um, detailed in the report. Uh, next slide. Um, we, we expect uh, uh, the prices to actually drop. Um, I think there is some discussions about ongoing about why haven't, uh, why haven't they gone down already because uh, the prices uh, of some of the raw materials are reducing. Um, and I think this is often from, from our sector, it has to do with the fact that um, sometimes the contracts are um, negotiated on a, on a yearly basis or a longer period, and they are being re renegotiated now. So while there maybe there was a, a price uh, level uh, for the previous year, now when you have to renegotiate, um, there might actually be still be increasing or not dropping, even though that some of the overheads are, are actually um, has have actually been reduced. Uh, so this was more of a, a general a general finding. Um, I um, I had a few slides also from some of the uh, from the national uh, situations. I do think having seen the previous uh, presentation uh, by Dimitar, um, this is probably maybe a little bit too generic. Um, what I was going to say is that we as Eurocommerce, we are also participating in uh, other market observatories that are organized by the Commission. And there, at, that, at those moments, we do actually ask our, our uh, national members to provide us with some in, inputs about how the market is, is moving. But these are, this is not complete. We don't have a complete, uh, we don't do a complete collection of all this uh, consumption and, and sales data. Um, but I think uh, we can see that indeed that we have seen a little bit of the same uh, trend of, 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 of meat and, and fish. It's, a, of course, a premium product or um, a, a more expensive product. And in these difficult times, this is where uh, volumes have, have definitely gone down. Um, and, um, and, and, and therefore, I thought it's maybe interesting to also show this uh, in relation to the, to the whole shopping basket. But this is particularly for Italy. Um, and the next slide is also on the organic uh, one. But uh, as I was mentioning, I think you and <laughs> you, Mofa, have more detailed information on this per country. And maybe this, um, maybe this would not uh, is just a snapshot of one of the one of the points that we got that uh, that we get from our members as well. Um, but so yeah, next slide is on the on the okay. Why is it not? Yeah, all right. Um, so on, on France, I think there we have seen a very strong drop in uh, in, in seafood uh, sales. So very concerning, uh, more than any other sectors. Um, some of them have kept uh, fairly okay. Um, well, the sale of fresh food has actually de decreased uh, by almost 3% in value. Um, but um, But... Indeed, um, the most hit categories would be the meat and, and, and seafood. Um, and, and this is, of course, yeah, we, we have already explained the market and the center consumer sentiment. So um, this is, of course, for this, for your sector, very, very well. Uh, next slide. Um, also here, we have seen here the, competitive, the, the comp comparison between 20, uh, 2020 and 2022. You see this um, uh, food prices increase, actually, um, when you have, of course, all the other costs that come on top of it to actually produce and to make the product, make the produce available. I think we have, of course, we have this increased cost uh, all along the supply chain, uh, as was mentioned, uh, definitely on the, in the shipping vessels with the, new, uh, the fuel prices, but of course also in our sector where you have the, the energy prices, which are very much impacting our, or have been very much impacting our sector as well with all the freezers and, uh, and the, uh, in store. Um, so, so I think all that has, has led to a, to a price increase uh, for, for, the, uh, for a lot of the food products. Uh, next slide. 
and because everybody in the end has to be able to um, you know to 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 get uh, their their overheads um, reimbursed to be able to be uh, to maintain in business so also here um, you see indeed the the comparison with um, with 20, 2021, 2022, and, and the first months of 2023, uh, a, a quite a severe um, increase here to cover for the costs that have been happening within the supply chain. Um, maybe the next ones are not so interesting. Uh, maybe the, maybe you can skip yeah, to this one. I think again here, uh, again, it's maybe in line with what was already presented. Um, choose to buy less of some of these products, of course, which they perceive as more expensive. And so the, the composition of the shopping basket is definitely uh, changing. But um, in, indeed, there is a difference between the market because in the EU, because in, in, in some countries, it's not the same diets and the same uh, um, uh, importance of certain food products in, in the shopping basket. And therefore, that might be uh, also have different effects um, the, the inflation has. Um, next, um, I think I can probably go quite quickly here as well. Um, also here, I think a similar picture. Um, it is uh, a lot of uh, less home consumption in, in, in Spain, um, um, but that was actually already um, compared 2022 to 2021. Uh, again, for the reason that we've given before, but we see, I think, for this sector, for the fisheries, that it is actually hitting all the markets or, or most of the markets um, in, in the EU. Um, yeah, so, but I just wanted to also uh, very briefly pause on the, the issue of the eco-labeling and, and, and what is to be on price and what, do we, what can we do uh, for the consumers? Because uh, indeed price sensitivity is one part. Um, but I think for our members, uh, the fisheries is a very uh, is a very important category, and this is something where there is a high interest from the consumers to know more about, as I was mentioning, about uh, the, the supply chain transparency, the sustainability aspects, in addition to the nutritional aspects. So this is something where our members really strongly work on, and I think you probably know um, maybe the metros are a wholesaler has set up this uh, this app where you can really find a, a lot of information. I think especially if you serve uh, restaurants, it's really important to have a very, um, that your clients that are, um, you know, from restaurants that they really can can choose a product and or can also invite, advise their clients about the, the products that they're offering on the menu. So I think this is quite interesting. If you don't know this, then I can also invite you to, to take a look. Uh, and the next slide, is another uh, aspect is also again depending of course on uh, on the on the on the member state and on the on the society there is also uh, specific um, specific uh, campaigns towards consumers to inform about sustainable fisheries uh, and to really respond to this demand uh, by consumers and then the other part would be indeed to help uh, in 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 in, in, in cooking recipes which uh, is is also something that our members actually um, invest quite a bit into help the customers in, in, in their purchasing and in their setting their their um, their um, yeah their, their recipes and their their week menu basically and the next one we, and we're almost reaching the end um, the next slide is I, this is what I'm mentioning uh, also we've seen some of the um, one of the eco labels already uh, but it's just the fact is indeed this is this ask this clear ask for consumers where does it come from um, we have the opportunity, not, not all consumers are equally interested, but those that are interested, they can find a lot of, um, a lot of uh, information via uh, our, many of our, our members' websites, um, and they can really trace the product back to where, where the catch area and, and or more information about the eco, uh, eco schemes. And the next slide, um, and another, uh, also our, our, our members would have um, um, uh, partnerships with NGOs to really sort of also check and 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 and, and go on this path to sustainability together. Um, various aspects, uh, but really, uh, really in response to consumer demand, and really, as I was mentioning, to go beyond just the price aspect, but really that uh, the consumers actually uh, appreciate and acknowledge the product for 
for what it's for what it is. So next slide uh, is so a few key messages um, uh, that you have seen is uh, down trading is happening uh, all in everywhere, uh, not only products but also in the store formats. Uh, a shift to private label, uh, high income consumers also actually becoming quite uh, or very uh, price sensitive, but health is maintaining strong. Um, concerns by the business, by the CEOs about margin pressure and um, the continuing uh, efforts by, um, by the retail and wholesale to really focus on the sustainability and voluntary initiatives. And I think lastly, I didn't touch upon it, but um, we really also call, we've always been calling for more education of the consumer that they actually also uh, are aware about, about, about the benefits of the different product categories. And thereby we can also communicate to them uh, in a more uh, in an in an easier and more transparent manner. So yeah, I'll stop there, and I'm happy to um, hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Els, uh, for uh, the very interesting and uh, and uh, consistent uh, presentation. It was uh, very interesting to see how like the consumers' uh, behavior is uh, is. Uh, been uh, impacted in the in the latest uh, period. So um, you mentioned a lot the importance, of course, in uh, uh, health and uh, nutritional benefits of food uh, when uh, for the consumer's choice. So uh, what are the opportunities that uh, you, as in your experience, in uh, you see for retail and wholesaler to ensure that consumers don't only uh, consider the price when uh, purchasing uh, something, but also the nutritional and benefits aspect uh, of uh, of the product itself. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, indeed, I think labeling still makes a very important um, as an important role for this. But it's also uh, the placement in store. I think we can see also that it's the fresh produce is still um, a good place for for consumers also to actually get advice and to learn from from the shop uh, people in the shop about about the, the benefits and advantages. And as I was mentioning, if you go and look also in on, on the websites of our of our members, you can see a lot of uh, information about uh, how to prepare the products, how to have a sustainable diet. If you have specific dietary needs, uh, they will also be helped. Uh, and there's also apps for that. They will also be helped to actually choose the right products for them. So I think we our, our members really work on a whole uh, range of different um, uh, initiatives uh, beyond labeling, like I said, but also in store. And there's also initiatives outside, and, and, and I would say um, even even with 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 um, uh, towards with schools or children to to really explain also what uh, what what healthy and sustainable food looks like. So I think we try to work on on different uh, on different angles, uh, ideally with partners, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, but it's 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 we are the first port of call for the consumers. So and and I think we are very happy to to, to provide them with this uh, with this information. Yeah, of course. And how do you see the situation will uh, will uh, will evolve in uh, in the in the upcoming like uh, period? Like, uh, from how do you see like uh, based on uh, your insight, like uh, your internal view? Um, yeah. So let's hope that the price will go down a bit. But we, of course, have this whole transition to sustainability. So I think there is also uh, the mention of the debate: uh, do do consumers um, value the food enough? So we really have this. Yeah, and now we have a little bit of a, a, a double um, a message here. On the one hand, it has to be cheaper um, and on the, it has to be affordable. And on the other hand, we have to value it and we have to make sure that everybody gets sufficient return on their on their investment. So this is where we have to. And that's why it's important, I think, that on the sustainability debate, we have to all move together. There's really it's not a again, it's not a one 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 solution. It's just really that we go into this together. But what I wanted to say is that for, I think for fisheries and I think for our sector, and this was also mentioned uh, by, by the previous speaker, uh, sometimes many of our, our members have made very strong commitments about fisheries. Um, this is a sensitive, uh, this is something where consumers are sensitive to, uh, and they made, the, they made the commitments to, for example, uh, you know, raise the, the level of, 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 of um, of sourcing and sustainability uh, criteria and so in that way you actually take away the, the choice or the difficulty for the consumer to, to choose but you really want to be, 
play a part in, in just raising standards and, and, and just making sure that everybody uh, go, goes up on, on, on that level. And I think this is a clear commitment. Sustainability is top of mind of, of all businesses. Uh, so we're definitely going to be working on that and uh, together with everybody else. Basically. Yeah, of course, of course. Thank you very much, Els. I think that uh, now we can move on to our next speakers, but uh, uh, please keep asking questions so we can take them uh, over after the last presentation. We'll have a few more minutes for last round of questions. Um, so I'm uh, now happy to, thank you very much, Els, of course. I am uh, happy to introduce uh, our uh, third speaker, uh, Patrizio Piozzi. Uh, Patrizio, he's, um, uh, he's uh, from uh, Ismea, the Italian Institute of Services for the Agricultural and the Food Market Business Intelligence. At Ismea, Patrizio manages the data collection and processing of information assets. Patrizio is an agronomist specialized in market analysis of the fishery sector. He has extensive experience in market data collection and economic analysis in the agri-food sector. He has conducted numerous projects related to the agri-food and agricultural supply chain observation, where he developed new data collection networks and wholesale and retail and at the wholesale and retail stage. Patrizio has supported twinning projects in Algeria and Tunisia in collaboration with the French Agriculture Ministry for the development of an agricultural market monitoring system and for the launching of a product quality label. Patrizio has been focal point for the FAO Agricultural Market Information System for almost 10 years. So welcome, Patrizio. The floor is yours. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Good morning, everybody. And um, before starting uh, and entering, into, entering the subject, I would like to spend some few words more on Ismea. Uh, you said correctly, Ismea is the uh, Institute for uh, Services for the Agricultural and Agri-Food uh, Market. Uh, it's a public body uh, who works on behalf of the Agricultural Ministry. And behind the, 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 uh, the activity of uh, uh, agricultural, agricultural market analysis, uh, Ismea delivers uh, several uh, services from financial to assurance services to all the agricultural, agri-food and fishery uh, enterprise. Um, today, in this uh, uh, presentation that we have uh, prepared, uh, we will have a look to the uh, fish and agriculture product consumption, uh, what's happening in Italy, uh, recent trends, and uh, uh, which are the consumer behaviors, uh, above all, after the pandemic period, and uh, uh, the consequent of the war uh, with the price inflation. Uh, but just before entering in the, in the, in the uh, consumption subject, uh, let me uh, give you some information about the uh, scenery, uh, the current scenery in Italy uh, of the um, fish and aquaculture uh, sector. We can say that this sector in Italy uh, is suffering uh, because in the last 10 years, we have registered a deep decrease of the production. We talk about uh, less 40%. Uh, we passed to, from uh, 400,000 and 55 tons of 2010 uh, to uh, 200,073 tons estimated for uh, 2021, uh, a deep decrease. Uh, a decrease also in the fishing fleet, that's about uh, a reduction of 10%, and uh, also in the gross tonnage, 20% uh, of the reduction, uh, which is the consequence of this. Uh, the consequence is the EV dependence or imports uh, of seafood. Uh, the Italian market is uh, uh, dependent on supplies from abroad. Uh, we, <clears throat> we estimate that just about 90% of domestic consumption is supplied by imports 
and the consequence is a, 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 a fish stream balance uh, um, uh, very, very uh, uh, red, we, we call it very red. Uh, in the last year, we reached uh, 6.4 billion of deficit. Uh, regarding the consumption, if you have a look to a long term trends, we can say that uh, uh, the fish consumption is quite stable. Uh, we, we, we are around 20, 21, 21 kilos per capita. And it's equally distributed between uh, the household consumption and the uh, out of home uh, uh, consumption. Uh, even if in the last 10 years we notice uh, a slight drop in seafood consumption. Uh, and what's happened during the, 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 the pandemic period and uh, the, uh, the following years with the war and with the economic crisis and the price inflation. Uh, during the pandemic period, we had uh, uh, an increase of the, of the household consumption uh, due uh, above all to the closure of restaurants, to the isolation of people during the pandemic period. Uh, the following year, 2022, uh, the country we have registered a drop in the domestic consumption, above all due to the economic crisis and the price uh, uh, inflation. Um, now, it's important, I think, to underline which is the source. Uh, I noticed that health. Uh, uh, in, in one of its uh, slide, its figure uh, use uh, uh, as as a source. Um, uh, uh, actually, the source is the the, the Nielsen IQ Company Consumer Panel. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's a domestic consumption survey. Uh, it's diffused all, all over the world. Uh, in Europe, but also in other other countries in, in all the world. And uh, in Italy, we had a family panel of 9,000 families. Uh, it's a, a, a panel um, representative of the universe of Italian families that are 24.8 million families. Uh, the panel is, is, is organized uh, and stratified just to represent uh, all the all the area um, and above all all the demographic variables of the families. Uh, so we have information about the components of the family, the age of the components, the income, uh, the children, uh, the children presence, and uh, the family uh, register uh, uh, every day uh, every purchase. Uh, uh, food pushes uh, with all the information re related. So the distribution channel, the price, the barcode, uh, if there are special offers, and obviously the total uh, expense. Uh, every month, uh, we think, uh, deliver us the, the, the database and, um, and we process data uh, in Ismea and produce uh, every month uh, uh, an analysis of the uh, consumption, household consumption uh, trend. Well, um, uh, in, the, in the household consumption uh, 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 basket, uh, and this is the, the, the same figure of else, we, we, it's, inter it's interesting to uh, underline, underline uh, the share of seafood in the food expense uh, uh, basket. Um, and you can see seafood represent 8.2%. Uh, but if you, sorry, if you um, had meat, and curry meat, you notice that uh, seafood is uh, uh, just about half. So we can say that in Italy, uh, seafood consumption, consumption could be 
uh, could be uh, improved, still improved. Um, remaining on the uh, food uh, consumption basket, we can uh, have a look of the recent, recent trends. Uh, we divided the two period after pandemic and uh, uh, 2022, just to underline uh, the difference of the two uh, period. You notice that uh, you can notice that uh, uh, in 2022 we registered uh, an increase of the expense or the value uh, uh, food shopping. Regarding the seafood, uh, on the contrary, uh, we have registered an increase after the pandemic period, so in 2021. On the contrary, the last year we had a, 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 a contraction due uh, above all to the price uh, inflation. And this is obviously has an impact on the uh, volume dynamics on the right. Uh, you can see that seafood uh, has a, a deeper decrease of the quantity in 2022. Okay, entering in the, in the seafood uh, product, we, we, we can have uh, uh, an overview of the total seafood purchases. Uh, here, we in this figure, we have the last five years. It's quite interesting to uh, to underline how in uh, just in 2022 we have a, 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 an important contraction of the uh, purchases in tones in volume less evident the contraction in in uh, terms of value uh, this is this what this means it means that uh, the price inflection, uh, so the increasing of prices uh, has an impact uh, on the volume and on uh, uh, the contraction of the expense. Uh, this is the proof. Uh, we have the, the, the medium price, the total seafood medium price in the last five years. And you can see the, the strong uh, increase of the last year, uh, more 6.2%. Uh, percent. And, and this, this trend is uh, quite similar for the three categories that normally we consider in the analysis. The fresh, the fresh product, the frozen, and the canned smoking and, and, and dry. Uh, obviously, the, the fresh product has the, the higher medium price. Um, well, we, we, we have uh, introduced the, the, the category, so we uh, get a look to the uh, composition uh, of the uh, purchase basket uh, in terms of volume. And you see that fresh products are the most important uh, category, uh, more evident in terms of value on the right, but anyway, uh, also in volume, it's uh, 46 percent. Uh, second position for the can of smoking and dried, and then the frozen, the frozen products. Uh, the dynamics of the category uh, we can see that the contraction in terms of volume of the uh, purchases is more evident for fresh fish less, more than less uh, 10%. Uh, this is because the, the, obviously the fresh fish have, have the, the higher medium price. Okay, we can go uh, now to um, an overview by product. I think it's quite interesting to see the, 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 the ranking of the uh, seafood purchases in Italy. Here we have the 10 most purchased seafood products. Uh, first position for the can of tuna uh, that represent more than 20% of the uh, volume. Uh, second position for the frozen cold, 
cooked that fresh fresh sea bream and some of the other. Um, quite quite interesting to show these dynamics. The last uh, five years, uh, there's been a, a, a strong increase of the fresh squid and also of the smoked salmon in terms of volume. Uh, if you get a look to the fresh products, you can notice in the first position sea bream, then salmon, and then sea bass. So if you had the sea bass and sea bream, uh, you notice how these products, these aquaculture products, are very important uh, in Italy. They represent together uh, more than 15% of the uh, which is a volume. And in terms of dynamics, uh, 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 from, it's quite interesting, uh, above all for, for us, for uh, an Italian point of view, it's quite interesting the decrease of the fresh anchovies and of the fresh uh, uh, Macara, yes, uh, the, above all the fresh mussel. So the, the Italian products that are suffering uh, in the supply, the supply chain. Then the same for the processed products. Uh, obviously, canned tuna is the, the first position, then the frozen cone, the smoked salmon, and so on, and the others. Um, the dynamics of the smoked salmon is quite surprising. Uh, in effect, it's one of the most important products uh, uh, in Italy. Uh, then we can uh, uh, have a look to the um, trend by consumer profile. Uh, the panel consumer allow us to analyze the, the consumer behavior uh, related to their uh, uh, most important characteristics, number of components or uh, age of the purchasing manager, uh, and then in the, in the following slide also by, by income. Uh, I explained the purchasing manager is the, you can say the, the responsible for food purchasing, the, the family component who makes food purchases more frequently in, in, uh, in the family. And um, you, you notice again that in almost all the cases, we have a, a, a positive dynamics uh, considering, the, considering the five years, starting to, from uh, 2018, uh, arriving to the last year. Uh, on the contrary, if you consider the dynamic only for 2022, in most cases, uh, in all cases, uh, the, the trend is negative. Uh, quite interesting to underline that uh, um, uh, families with five components and the family with put the purchasing manager uh, between 35 to 45 years old uh, have registered a, a negative trend in all the period. Uh, on the right, you have a detail only for fresh food, but uh, it's quite uh, uh, similar. Uh, in the negative trends, we can have other uh, family profile, and four components, uh, and uh, uh, with the purchasing manager over 64 years old. Uh, more interesting, I think, is uh, uh, have a look to the uh, consumer behavior uh, related to the, uh, the family type, we can say, and the, the, the income level. Uh, on the right, uh, we have the total seafood. Uh, on the left, sorry, we have the total seafood. On the right, the fresh uh, seafood. Um, it is quite interesting to underline that the low affluence, so family with a lower, lower income, uh, uh, are suffering uh, in all the period. 
both in the five years and um, normally in the last uh, the last year. Uh, also, the new families. Um, you can see the new families are the families with young with young children. Uh, in case of the fresh food, uh, we 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 notice uh, other negative trends for the post families, older couples, and the pre families. Uh, it's confirmed the negative trend for the low affluence. Um, then it's interesting also uh, understand I, how is composed the the. the the purchase basket by family type and by family income. On the left, the family type, and you can see that the older couples are the most representative for um, seafood purchases. Uh, on the contrary, the pre-family and the new families uh, are the less representative. Uh, on the right, uh, the income level, um, we consider Two categories: above average affluency and uh, below average average affluency. I can see to simplify uh, families that uh, have uh, uh, an income around the average are the most important for uh, seafood purchases. Uh, just about sixty percent, a share of sixty percent percent. On the contrary, low affluency are uh, normally less uh, representative, uh, 80%, uh, it's quite normal, we can say. Uh, what is interesting is that the high affluency, so family with high, higher income, uh, represent only 20% of uh, seafood consumption, seafood purchases. Uh, we suppose, <laughs> That uh, this is the, the reason is that uh, they prefer to eat fish at the restaurant. It's uh, easier, you can say. Okay, now the, the, the last, the last, uh, the last figure. Um, just to the uh, distribution channel, uh, which are the most important in Italy. You can see that. Uh, the, 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 the big surface, uh, superstore and supermarket represent almost half the market, uh, are growing the mini market and the discount, while the traditional shop currently at 23% of the share uh, are suffering, uh, we can say since 20, 20 years, 25 years. Um, you can imagine how, how many traditional uh, shop, fish shop, uh, Italian pescheria, uh, and how, how, how much they are diffused uh, in uh, our territory uh, along the coast. You know, we have the famous 8,000 kilometers coast. Um, but in the last, uh, yes, I think 20 years, uh, they lose, uh, they lose market quota uh, above all for the, uh, the, 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 the increase of the presence of the, the, the big surface uh, everywhere, you can see. And th this trend is confirmed uh, in our uh, analysis, uh, both in the, the, the five years period uh, and in the last uh, in the last year, 2002 uh, on 2021. Okay, I finished. Thank you for uh, the attention. Uh, if you uh, allow me uh, just to thank my colleague that uh, helped me to uh, process and realize this presentation, Francesca Carbonari and Paola Parmigiani. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Patrizio. Thank you very much for the very good insight on the uh, Italian uh, seafood uh, consumption and the general um, purchase and uh, uh, overview in the in the last five years. So, um, just to uh, follow up question, 
Um, what do you see? Because you, we have seen, you have showed us the uh, most uh, recent trends in uh, in regards of uh, uh, the dynamic for uh, for fish consumption for 2022. Um, what do you expect for uh, the for now, for example, for 2023 or for the next uh, period? Uh, is uh, the trend going to be similar? We do we should we expect uh, differences in categories? Fresh, frozen, cancel. If you maybe can elaborate on that. Uh, well, okay, we we, we have uh, uh, already uh, uh, have a look on the twenty three data of the first quarter, and unfortunately, we confirm this trend. We we have a generalized decrease of food consumption. Uh, and uh, also for the uh, fish and aquaculture product, a generalized decrease. Uh, we have noticed only a, a reaction, we can say, for the fresh products. Uh, the only the only product that have a, a, a positive trend in the first quarter uh, as. Um, consumption, household consumption. Okay, okay, thank you. That's uh, a little bit uh, sad to hear, but uh, hopefully at, uh, at some point uh, this, this trend will, uh, will manage to change. I've seen that, that there is a very interesting uh, question from uh, the audience, and it is uh, how can the data of consumer profiles, meaning I guess the age and the family groups, can be used to implement the changes that will affect the markets? Are there ways that this group can be targeted directly? I think this is a very interesting uh, question for you, Patrizia, but maybe also else could, uh, I don't know if uh, you have also something that you could uh, input, but uh, I don't know. Uh, Patrizia, what uh, do you know, like uh, any? Yes, but a very interesting uh, question, uh, but I, it would need a, 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 a complicated answer. Uh, I think that it's a very um, uh, powerful, the, 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 the Nielsen IQ, Panel consumer, there are a lot of information, and it could be useful to uh, use this information, this elaboration, uh, to understand the consumer behavior and to, I can say, to apply some uh, intervention uh, on the market. Uh, I can say uh, uh, with, the, with the same approach. That before uh, else uh, uh, talked about. Uh, I, I, I mean uh, uh, the, the transparency, the current information, and uh, the uh, yes, the current information about uh, uh, products, about uh, uh, the provenience, uh, uh, about the importance of uh, um, correct uh, alimentation. Uh, can can uh, can improve uh, the, 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 in this case I think I, I, I talk uh, about the fish product no where mm -hmm. I, I say at the beginning uh, the difference between uh, the meat consumption and the seafood production this means that uh, the seafood production uh, could improve, but could improve uh, uh, besides uh, some um, specific policy um, uh, above all uh, regarding transparency and information uh, about that, uh, that uh, uh, products. On the other side, on the other side, in Italy, we have also uh, um, some important governative initiative to I can say to monitor the, the level price. No, you know, um, uh, this is uh, uh, there. There is in Italy um, a lot of attention to the difference between the different uh, stage of the supply chain, uh, the price difference be be between among the different uh, stage of the supply chain, 
and the government as the instruments to uh, do intervention, to monitor and to check if, uh, for example, if there are uh, speculation of uh, uh, not, not correct behavior of the wholesaler or the, 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 the last, uh, the last uh, uh, step of the supply chain. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Patrizio. So maybe we can have a last round of question before closing, and because uh, uh, there has been uh, lots of activity in the in the question. So maybe I will have a start with uh, Dimitar. Ah, I'm Dimitar. You have a comment? Yes, please go ahead. Um, just a quick question, if I may, um, Patrizio. We have seen a lot of uh, data, very uh, detailed, disaggregated data. I wanted to ask Patrizio if if you have any um, data or any uh, personal uh, observations of what is the situation with eco labels in the Italian market, uh, does the Nielsen data provide this kind of level of detail? Maybe from your uh, other sources or other observations, what would you say uh, is the trends on the Italian market regarding uh, eco labeling? Thank you. Well. Um... Uh, in, in the panel consumer, the, the Nielsen IQ panel consumer, um, we don't still have this kind of information. We, 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 we are trying to improve uh, all, uh, also this, 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 uh, this data, uh, but it's quite complicated because, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a, every, every time, uh, Nielsen uh, uh, must uh, must uh, teach we can say must teach to the family how to register the data and and uh, how to register each information. So it, it's it's not quite uh, it's not simple. Um, anyway, we have other kind of observatory, uh, uh, not for consumption, but for production price level and uh, and. Uh, uh, we can say uh, competitive indicators for the market for all the, the um, geogra geographical indication products uh, that are very diffuse in Italy, such as in, in, in France. But this, the, the, the specific information on consumption, uh, not yet. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you, Patrizia, and thank you, Dimitar, for uh, for uh, the the question. So maybe we can take the last one because, uh, given the time, uh, we will have to close uh, shortly. And uh, this is a question that uh, is addressed to any of you. So any one of you that wants to uh, comment is uh, is is welcome, or the first one that wants to answer. So, um, and we go back to certification and eco labeling. So, could any of the three comment on the effect of sustainability certification eco eco labeling on producers' decision? Producer must believe that their investment in certification and sustainable production will translate into revenue. The existence and price premium may not guarantee that producer gain benefit if the premium is not transmis transmitted back through the value chain. So maybe Dimitar, uh, do you have a comment on that or also else? Um, yeah, sure. Else, if you if you would like to go first, or I may take this uh, question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think you can look at it from 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 both sides. I think it is uh, it, it will allow you to have access to the market, and that market is asking you for this. Um, the consumer is asking for this, so it will actually help you. And in, of course, we would want this premium to also uh, reach the the producer or reach actually all levels um, in in the supply chain. But I think let's look at the fact that this is this is. This will put you in front of your competitors. This will this will really guarantee your place on the market. And our our members, I think, as you have also seen, they have made promises, quite strong sustainability commitments, uh, and I think are very eager to keep to stick to those. Of course, because we are also quite in the public eye. Um, so um, in the end, the idea is that we all benefit from it. That's the only way that things can be sustainable, also economically. I think that's what I could uh, could add to that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, else, um, if I may add just a, a couple of thoughts. 
this answer uh, indeed um, it's um, a form of accessing a market uh, accessing a preferred market um, the European uh, market or uh, any market uh, that requires certification even though uh, in some cases it may not result in um, any uh, price premium transmitted back uh, to the uh, producer uh, may have other benefits such as for example quantities of uh, 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 product uh, supplied it's a large market um, um, uh, the uh, periods of, of uh, uh, contracts which may be uh, more preferential than, than for other other markets as well so in, in a way it's a it's a preferred market um, uh, that can be more profitable even though there is no price premium associated with it in the cases when there isn't. But also um, uh, profit may result from other sources such as uh, a recent paper, uh, if I remember correctly from the um, uh, University of Santander uh, shows that um, um, Companies, larger companies who decide to get certified, uh, have their uh, share prices increase. So, so uh, profitability may 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 come from from that end as well, um, from their shareholders, um, from um, from their share prices. Sorry, uh, and also. Um, if you implement in aquaculture, particularly if you if you implement better management practices, which is part of the uh, standards uh, requirement, um, that may result in efficiency of the overall production process. So you may cut down your costs, for example, for disease management. If you implement better management practices, that result in overall less disease, um, less feed being lost uh, in the environment, um, overall more efficient practices that may help as well reduce the cost. So there are different sources of, of benefit. It's not only uh, the price premium, but um, but, but also uh, other ones. I, ha I hope this um, answers the question. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Um, so I think that uh, we are unfortunately coming towards the end of this talk. Uh, these were all the, talk, the questions that we have uh, had time for uh, from our audience today. And uh, I would like to remind you that uh, the talk has been uh, recorded and it will be made available on the uh, UMOFA YouTube channel and on the UMOFA website. And uh, I saw that uh, many of the audience have asked for the presentation. Presentations will be available also on the UMOFA, um, on the UMOFA website uh, uh, shortly in the upcoming days. Also, uh, if you want to stay updated on the latest news about the UMOFA talks, events, publications, uh, please subscribe to the newsletters and I've seen that you have the link in the, in the chat box, as well with the, uh, a study that we have done on online sales on fisheries and aquaculture products that was done in uh, UMOFA in 2021 to follow up on uh, what else has been uh, 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 talking to us today. And um, last and not least, I would like to thank uh, the speaker, our speakers today. Thank you, uh, Patrizio, Els, and uh, Dimitar for your very interesting presentation. Also, for uh, thank you to the UMOFA team that has been helping organizing this event and uh, to Digimare. And I would like to thank uh, also the audience and uh, for your participation and uh, for your question. And uh, also, thank to everyone. Have a nice uh, day and a very nice summer. So finally, we are here. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if Christoph, you want to say something more, please. Well, no, no, no nothing more really. Thanks a lot uh, for your presentation, the colleagues, uh, for indeed the Yumofa team for having organized uh, uh, this uh, this talk, and uh, to the audience for having been interested and sharing their questions. We are. As uh, already said, uh, available for any possible clarification or questions you would have. So do not hesitate to send us directly to DJ Mare or to the UMOFA team any question you might have. And wishing you a very nice uh, summer and seeing you at the next uh, UMOFA talk. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> have a nice day. Bye bye.